Hey there. Today on Big Out Books, I wanted to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is Canadian literature. I wanted to make this video because there's going to be an entire Canadian themed readathon happening from August 3rd through 9th. It is called the Read A Thon, and it's being co hosted by a bunch of great Canadian booktube creators. I personally found out about this readathon from Natasha from the channel My Reading is Odd, so I'll link some more information about the readathon down below. But one thing that I find particularly impressive about this readathon is that the creators didn't just come up with a list of like four or five prompts this year. They came up with an entire bingo card with 16 different prompts. I love this because it gives you so much freedom and flexibility when you're putting together your TBR. But also these prompts are really inspired to make you go in diverse different directions throughout the week. So in my video today, I wanted to give you some book recommendations for each square on this bingo card. Maybe you'll find that helpful if you're participating in the readathon, but even if you're not, and especially even if you're not Canadian or have like never been to Canada, I still think that Canadian literature is well worth checking out. You know, we are a very strange, quirky, unique country. There's a lot of diversity in terms of Canadian geography that you can read about in the settings of these books. There's so much diversity in terms of the Canadian population. Canada is a bilingual country and there is a really robust francophone literary culture here. Also, I talk about this a lot on my channel, but there are so many incredible First Nations, Métis, and Inuit authors working from Canada today. Also, a lot of Canadian writers have either moved here themselves from other places or their families have come from different countries, so there's a lot of cultural variety that you can find within Canadian literature. Even though Canadian literature has its fair share of drama and scandals, in fact, there's an entire book about why the Canadian literary institution is problematic and needs to be like torn down and built back up again. I still think that there is a lot of passion in Canada's literary community and you can really see that passion and that joy in a lot of these books that I'm going to be talking about today. So the first prompt on the bingo card is to read a book by an Indigenous author and I had a really hard time just trying to focus on one author but I think that Leanne Batas Samasake Simpson would be an excellent author to check out for this readathon. She's a Michi Sagig Nishnabeg author and I think she's perfect for a readathon because she writes both fiction and nonfiction and poetry and music. Also, a lot of her books are on the shorter side, which I think comes in handy in a readathon, especially one that's only a week long. So it won't take you too much time to get through one of her books, but I have found each of her books to be unique, moving, thought provoking works. She has taught me so much and I just really enjoy reading her work. So this accident of being lost and islands of decolonial love are kind of like mixed media collections. You're going to find some poems in here, some songs, some short story type pieces. And then if you're looking for some more traditional traditional nonfiction. This is Dancing on Our Turtle's Back and As We Have Always Done, which are both dealing with the topic of resurgence and what that looks like for Indigenous people in a Canadian context. The next prompt is for a book about a loving relationship. I had three that came to my mind for this one and the first one is super strange and that is Where Did You Sleep Last Night by Lynn Crosby and this is basically some weird Kurt Cobain fanfic. It's about a teenage girl who is super miserable, she tries to overdose on drugs and she wakes up in the hospital and guess who's in the hospital bed beside her? It's Kurt Cobain but it's also kind of not, he doesn't really remember his old life. He reinvents himself as a rock star named Celine black and these two get into some really twisted strange adventures together. Now the loving relationship in this book is kind of toxic and problematic but I really like how this book is investigating how teenagers put so much of their heart and soul into worshipping these idols like these people that you don't really know but who mean so much to you at that age. So this does a great job of examining that fan relationship while also just being a bizarre fun kind of story. I'd also recommend Theory by Dion Brand. This novel is fun but whip smart at the same time and it's about a failed academic who has been trying to finish up their thesis for years and years and they're reflecting back on different key relationships that they've had. So it's not really about one loving relationship, rather it's about multiple relationships that have all ended up going wrong in the end. But I like how this book examines how different people come in and out of our lives. They shape us in these different kind of ways. It's exploring what makes us a 
attracted to someone, why relationships fall apart in the end, and what can we learn from these experiences. So I do really recommend this one, especially if you've never checked out Dion Brand before. I also wanted to recommend A Complicated Kindness by Miriam Taves. This is not so much about a romantic loving relationship, it's more about a father-daughter familial relationship. So this is about a small family that lives in a Mennonite community, and the mother and one of the daughters are kind of free-spirited individuals, and they have gotten themselves excommunicated. So they have left the picture, and this is all about the father and the other daughter who are left behind, and they are trying to keep their family going, but it's a really heartbreaking relationship to follow because because they are both dealing with so much pain and grief and loss and they're not quite able to express that to each other nor are they able to really properly communicate what it is that they're going through but I thought their relationship was so tender but so complex and definitely worth reading about. Next is a book from a Canadian publisher. There were three publishers I wanted to mention. One of them is House of Anansi Press, and they do a bunch of different things with their books. I find that they release a lot of new and exciting literary fiction and poetry titles, like Small Game Hunting at the local Coward Gun Club, The Break by Katerina Vermet, and NDN Coping Mechanisms by Billy Ray Belcourt. They also publish nonfiction. I particularly like their CBC Massey Lecture series because these are usually smaller, condensed books but they always take on interesting topics. And also Anansi does a great job of republishing Canadian classics, especially ones that you may have overlooked before in the past. I think they do a great job of giving these works new and exciting covers, and they also do a great job of representing Quebecois authors in the Canadian canon as well. I also wanted to shout out University of Regina Press. Their nonfiction selections are outstanding, especially if you're looking to learn more about the history of colonization in Canada. I would highly recommend Clearing the Plains, Disease, Politics of Starvation, and Loss of Aboriginal Life by James Daszak. No Surrender, The Land Remains Indigenous by Sheldon Krasowski, which is all about the numbered treaties in Canada, and Children of the Broken Treaty, Canada's Lost Promise and One Girl's Dream by Charlie Angus. Also, they have put out the incredible memoir In My Own Moccasins by Helen Knott. So yes, outstanding nonfiction from University of Regina Press. And lastly, I wanted to mention Metonymy Press. I haven't read a lot of their books, but I'm very interested in the stuff that they're publishing. Here's a quote from their website about what they do. They say, we publish literary fiction and nonfiction by emerging writers. We try to reduce barriers to publishing for authors whose perspectives are underrepresented in order to produce quality materials relevant to queer, feminist, and social justice justice communities. We really want to keep gay book lovers satisfied, and that is a great mission. I've really enjoyed the memoir by Lindsay Nixon that they published called Natisanak, and also they put out Fierce Femmes and Notorious Liars, which is a very creative novel by Kai Chen Tom. The next prompt is for a book with nature on the cover, which honestly is a lot of Canadian literature. I just went over to my Indigenous author shelf and pulled five titles that kind of jumped out at me, so here were my five favorite covers. Medicine River by Thomas King. This is set in the prairies, but I really love the cloud action going on in this cover. Night Moves by Richard Van Camp. This is set in the Northwest Territories, and this is a stunning picture of the Arctic sun. Then Kiss of the Fur Queen by Thompson Highway. This is again capturing that Arctic climate. Passage by Gwen Benaway. These poems have to do with waterways and movement, and this is a gorgeous Northern Ontario photo on this cover. Then we also have Embers by Richard Wagamese, and not only does this book have a stunning cover, but there are also many photos throughout the text. This is just kind of the author reflecting back on his Ojibwe culture and practice and how it's affected his life. The next prompt is to read a book set in a province or territory you haven't been to. Now everyone's answer for this is going to be kind of different depending on their own travel experience. For myself, I have never been to the Yukon, to Nunavut, or to Newfoundland. However, I feel like I know a little bit about some of those places from the reading that I've been able to do, including Tanya Tagak's Split Tooth. The way that she writes about Nunavut is very intriguing. She almost brings a supernatural side to the Arctic that I think is really cool in this kind of coming of age tale. And I really enjoyed learning more about Newfoundland when I was reading Small Game Hunting at the local Coward Gun Club by Megan Gale Coles. This novel involves an interconnected cast of characters who all have ties to this fine dining restaurant in St. John 
Bonds. The whole action of this novel takes place over one day. There's a blizzard coming to town, it's Valentine's Day, and everyone's personal lives are just falling apart at the same time. This book is juicy and dramatic and intense, and I really recommend it. The next prompt is for a book that deals with Black Canadian history. I would really recommend Policing Black Lives by Robin Maynard for this one. Even though this book is dealing with a lot of present day problems, the opening material at the start of this book goes through a lot of history about racism in Canada. It's very eye-opening and informative, and it covered a lot of history that I had never learned myself in schools. The problem with talking about anti-Black racism or systemic oppression in Canada is that a lot of people don't really know a lot about Canada's own history with slavery and racism, so I think this book does a great job of providing you with a lot of concise context about the past and showing you how that past still has horrific consequences in the present day. Next is to read a book by a debut author. Two that I've just recently read that came to mind were Shut Up You're Pretty by Taya Mutonji. Now this has been marketed as a collection of stories but actually it kind of feels a bit more like a novel because it is the same main character so you are seeing her at different moments in her life. Um, I especially enjoyed the stories when she was younger. She was growing up in Scarborough and she was making some intense friendships and trying to figure out her sexuality and I liked those stories about kind of growing up a little bit too fast in the city. I'd also recommend Michelle Good's debut novel called Five Little Indians. She is a Cree author from the Red Pheasant Cree Nation in Saskatchewan and this is a heart-wrenching story about five residential school survivors. They are kind of cast out of the school and left to fend for themselves in the downtown east side of Vancouver and this is very much about how each of these characters is dealing with their own trauma from the past while trying to forge ahead, survive, and make new beautiful relationships, and it was a very powerful debut. I also wanted to shout out The Dishwasher by Stéphane Larue. This was translated from the French by Pablo Strauss, and this is just a gritty behind-the-scenes look of what it's like to work in a kitchen of a restaurant. So this is a very stressful and intense kind of novel because you're dealing with a lot of high-pressure situations in the kitchen of this restaurant environment, but also the main character in this book has a gambling addiction, so he makes a lot of poor choices in terms of his life after work. So I really liked how this book was such a page turner because you grew to care for the main character even though he was kind of a screw up, and I think that that was an impressive feat for a debut novelist to pull off. Apparently Stéphane Leroux is really into writing fantasy, but it just wasn't really happening for him, so he was encouraged to write more about what he knew, so he drew from his own kitchen experience and he made it into a really compelling, intense debut novel. The next prompt is to to read an LGBTQIA plus or queer story and I would recommend checking out a book by an indigenous two-spirit author. I particularly learned a lot more about the two-spirit identity from reading Joshua Whitehead's debut novel called Johnny Appleseed. Uh, to read you from the back of the book, the main character identifies as a young two-spirit indigiqueer and Indian glitter princess. So he's a really fabulous main character. He has this really engaging, funny narrative voice. The character also has a lot of wisdom and has a really unique way of seeing the world. I didn't quite love the way that the plot worked in this book, but that was kind of my own expectations I was bringing into this book. But if you really do want to meet an unforgettable two-spirit character, please do check out Johnny Appleseed. I also already mentioned this book earlier in this video, but this is Natisanak by Lindsay Nixon. And Lindsay Nixon writes really insightfully about how they were trying to find inclusivity and acceptance in different spaces like punk communities or the queer communities, and they never really found what they were looking for. So this book I thought was an eye-opening read. Another one I also mentioned was Fierce Femmes and Notorious Liars by Kai Chen Tom. The subheading for this one is A Dangerous Trans Girl's Confabulous Memoir. <laughs> this book is a truly wild ride. It's about a group of trans women who come together to form a vigilante girl gang called the Lipstick Lacerators. Basically, they are trying to protect their community from acts of violence. And as you can imagine, things get very intense and you start to wonder if they're taking things too far. So this book is taking on some very serious issues that are affecting the trans community, but it's also very fantastical. There are a lot of magical realism events that happen, and the narrator's tone is just very funny and descriptive most of the time. So when I describe this book, like on paper, I think it sounds perfect. Unfortunately, I didn't love the execution of it, but it is very short and I think it's still totally worth checking out because even though I had some issues with how this book was constructed, I still think that there is nothing like it out on the shelves. So for that, it is worth checking out. I also wanted to mention Laura Dean keeps breaking up with 
with me by Mariko Tamaki, illustrated by Rosemary Valero O'Connell. This is a very aesthetically pleasing graphic novel, and it's about a teenage girl who's dating another teenage girl who is kind of the worst. And it's just a cute coming of age story about a queer character who is realizing that she deserves better and she needs to do something differently with her life. Then I also wanted to quickly mention the subtweet by Vivek Shreya. So this is a book that's more about a female friendship than it is about a romantic relationship. But I had to mention this book somewhere in this video and I feel like it fits because one of the main characters is trans. But this book is kind of more about the tension that exists in this friendship between two musical artists. And they're both brown women of color trying to make it in the entertainment industry. They both have very different styles of music, but they have a lot of common. They form this friendship and then one of them just blows up and becomes really popular. And then the other one gets bitter and writes a shady subtweet and then there's just so much drama. So this is a short book. I think it's perfect for a readathon because you will not want to put it down. And there is some really sharp pointed social critique in here about cancel culture and how on the internet we are so quick to build people up and so quick to tear them down without really thinking about the consequences of these actions. So this is totally worth checking out. Next on our bingo card is to read a book that counts as anti-racism literature. So I already mentioned Policing Black Lives by Robin Maynard, but just once again, if you want to learn more about anti-black racism in Canada, I think this book is a great starting point. Also, I'm currently reading one right now that would fit really well for this category. It's called The Skin We're In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power by Desmond Cole. And this is taking a look at the year 2017, which was a pretty big year for Canada because we were celebrating our our 150th anniversary. So there was obviously a lot of activity with Indigenous activists who are kind of like, this country is much older than 150 years, you know, what are we really celebrating? Also, this book is going to document many other struggles in the fight against racism and oppression in Canada. So I think this is a great one to check out and I'm excited to become more informed after reading this book. And then lastly, again, I think it's really important to learn more about the history of colonization in Canada and how that affects the present day. And two books that I think are very accessible and informative entry points into this genre of nonfiction would be Unsettling Canada, A National Wake-Up Call by Arthur Manuel and Indigenous Rights, A Guide to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit Issues in Canada by Chelsea Vowell. She is a blogger and a lawyer and really funny and she does such a great job of breaking down really complex issues in this very smart book. It's like a textbook kind of, but it's really fun to read. So I recommend checking both of these books out. It will really help you understand more of the present situation in Canada today. The next prompt is to read a Canadian children's book. And my answer for this is going to be so basic and unoriginal, but if you haven't read Anne of Green Gables, man, what are you waiting for? You know, this was a book I read when I was younger and then I kind of forgot all about it. And I just kind of assumed that it was going to be a happy-go-lucky, annoying, boring children's story. And then I reread it again as an adult and just loved it. I thought this book was actually hilarious. Like Anne cracked me up so many times. She has this intense, overactive imagination and she's just a drama queen, which so am I. And the way that she reacts to situations is iconic and there's just so much fun to be had in this book. So if you haven't read this one before, really do yourself a favor and check this one out. Next is to read a book set in a province or territory you have been to. Again, what book you choose is going to depend on your own personal experience. I would say that my favorite province to read about would be British Columbia. That is my favorite part of Canada. But unfortunately, I am based here in good old Ontario. So I wanted to share some books with you that are about Ontario and I feel like really capture the setting. So one of my favorite writers who writes about Ontario is Andre Alexis and I've read two of his books. One of them is set in Toronto. This is 15 Dogs. So it's kind of a depiction of Toronto from an unusual perspective because we are following dogs who have been granted human consciousness following a bet in a bar between Hermes and Apollo, the Greek gods. So a lot going on in this book but I really do like how he brought different parts of the city to life through the smells and the sights and the sounds that the dogs are experiencing. I also really enjoyed his more recent novel, Days by Moonlight. This is just like a fun road trip through small town Ontario. It's about a guy 
guy who is driving around a professor who is trying to find this missing Canadian poet. So they're looking for him in these small towns, interviewing people that used to know him. They're trying to like get the scoop on the story, but then they end up having their own very strange experiences in each of these small towns. And I loved the different backstories and events and like strange details that you'd learn about each of these towns. So I read this and definitely it made me want to go driving around through Ontario this summer. I also enjoy how Robertson Davies writes about small town Ontario. This is the first book in his Deptford trilogy called Fifth Business. It's about a character named Dunstan Ramsey who ends up leading quite a remarkable life. He becomes a veteran in World War One, and then he becomes a professor and he writes about saints and he travels around Europe and around the world, but really nothing affects him more profoundly than the small incident that happened in his childhood. It just has these lasting repercussions throughout his whole life and this book explores that. And then Robertson Davies also wrote the Salterton trilogy and these books are all about Kingston, Ontario, which is a city where I lived for a brief period of time and I really loved Kingston and I feel like these books were kind of a funny look at the peculiarities of this town and he kind of makes fun of Canadians how like we try to appear like we're sophisticated and cultured but it just doesn't really come across as impressive as it might in an American or like a British context. So I really enjoy how he writes about this part of the world. And then lastly, I wanted to mention Ian Williams's novel Reproduction. This is set in Brampton, which is maybe not the most glamorous part of Ontario, but just like a lot of the references in this book were fun to read about if you grew up in southern Ontario in this kind of time period. Next is to read an immigrant or refugee story. Actually, the book that just won Canada Reads this year, We Have Always Been Here by Sumra Habib, would fit really nicely into this category. Although I don't want to get into the topic of the Canada Reads debates this year because I thought they were quite messy. But anyway, this book is a memoir about a girl whose family has moved to Canada as refugees. They were from a persecuted religious minority in Pakistan. And it's very much about her experience as she tries to fit in in this entirely new part of the world and then when she's in high school she finds out that she's in this arranged marriage to her older cousin and then she also realizes that she's queer and she's grappling with this identity and how it fits in with her beliefs as a Muslim. So obviously Sumra has a lot of interesting lived experience so check out that memoir if you want to learn more. And then also I wanted to mention some novels. One of them is Chorus of Mushrooms by Hiromi Goto. This is an intergenerational story about a family who has moved from Japan to the prairies in Canada. And what I love about this book is that each generation of women has their own experience of what it's like to be an immigrant in Canada and how they embrace or deny their Japanese heritage. So the grandmother in this book is obviously the one who is just the most connected to her culture and she has no interest in becoming Canadian. In fact, she mostly just sits on a chair in her house, doesn't move and just kind of daydreams like she's still back in Japan. And then this book kind of gets into her adventures when she gets up off her chair and leaves and she was like a fascinating character to read about. The mother of the family is someone who is really trying to assimilate and she wants to fit in in Canada so she is really rejecting a lot of her culture and she is just trying to act normal and fit in and then her daughter grows up kind of resenting that she didn't know a lot about her culture or her language because her parents thought it would be better for her to be more assimilated into Canadian culture but then this novel is also following that daughter's journey as she learns to become more connected to her culture in a different kind of way as she's growing up so I love that each member of this family has a different experience and it shows how complex it is to immigrate to another place. Also, so does the novel In Another Place Not Here by Dion Brand. There's an extra added complexity in this novel because the characters in this novel are from Trinidad and then they move to Canada. However, Dion Brand kind of writes about because of the history of the transatlantic slave trade, their families weren't really originally from Trinidad, so they kind of feel like they don't belong in any of these spaces. And it's kind of about navigating these places that aren't places and how you can really belong somewhere where you're not really from. So this book is exploring two women who get into a relationship with each other in Trinidad, but they both end up going to Canada at separate points. Even though the two women in this novel love each other, they are so different from each other. So I think there's such complex characterization happening in here, as well as I think this novel does a great job of depicting just how overwhelmingly strange it can be to move to another place, especially Toronto or Canada. Like if you're moving from the Caribbean into this Arctic hellhole, you know, it can 
be a really rough transition and I think she writes about that experience in a really compelling thought-provoking way. Moving in to the final row of the bingo card the next prompt is to read a Canadian Book Award nominee. So if you're not familiar with Canadian book prizes the big boy on the block is called the Giller Prize. I can be kind of hit or miss with the Giller Prize but there have been three winners from the past few years that I've really enjoyed including 15 Dogs by Andrea Alexis and Reproduction by Ian Williams which I've already mentioned and then also Essie Edgigan's Washington Black which is a really impressive piece of historical fiction that is also like a globe trotting tale of adventure so this is a really fun one to check out. However if the Giller is too mainstream for you I thought I'd mention the Indigenous Voices Awards. This is a fairly new prize in Canada and actually it was born from a controversy where a Canadian editor sarcastically proposed that there should be an appropriation prize where an author is awarded money and recognition for writing about an identity that has nothing to do with their own lived experience. Now making a joke about that kind of thing is in poor taste but the weird part of this story is that other people involved in the Canadian writing community started proposing that they would contribute money to this project on Twitter so you know people were like I'll pitch in $500 to this prize. So those Twitter responses made people pretty uncomfortable and that's why the Indigenous Voice Awards were created to kind of celebrate authors who are not being culturally appropriative but who are using their own lived experience as Indigenous people to inform their creative writing projects. I also like that these awards acknowledge work that has been written in English, in French, and in Indigenous languages. So three books that I've read that have previously won awards include the memoir From the Ashes by Jesse Thistle which was unfortunately and unfairly <laughs> voted off Canada Reads much too soon this year, as well as Tanya Tagak's novel Split Tooth, which I mentioned earlier as being set in Nunavut, as well as the poetry collection This Wound is a World by Billy Ray Belcourt. Next is to read a book with red on the cover, and for this one I would recommend Alicia Elliott's essay collection called A Mind Spread Out on the Ground. I think this book is going to be released in the United States soon, and the cover is actually more orange and blue. But anyway, it's been out for a while in Canada, and our cover is read. And this is a brilliant essay collection from one of the most exciting emerging Indigenous voices working in Canada right now. Alicia Elliott is a Tuscarora writer, and this essay collection is brilliant, and I try to recommend it to everyone because I think it is just genuinely so good. She is one of the most exciting emerging Indigenous voices working right now. And these essays are deeply personal. You know, she gets really raw and real in here about her childhood experiences, living in poverty in both the United States and Canada, living with her mother who had bipolar disorder, and with her own experiences coming to terms with her mixed race identity. So you will get to know Alicia Elliott on this deeply personal level, but I also appreciate how each of these essays is kind of structured around a different topic. So it might be something like photography or space, and she will weave that into her own personal recollections. These are just really well crafted, really personal, and I think that everyone should check this collection out. Next is to read a book by a Black author, and I've already mentioned quite a few Black authors in this video already, like Robin Maynard, Desmond Cole, Dion Brand, Andrea Alexis, Ian Williams, and Essie Edgigan. However, if you're looking for even more Black voices to check out, then I highly recommend this anthology called Black Writers Matter. This was edited by Whitney French, and this is a collection of essays that spans so many different perspectives. I really liked how diverse this collection was because it's not all just formally trained academic writers contributing to this. In fact, one of the essays is an interview with a taxi driver and he's just kind of giving some real talk about his everyday experience. So I think that each essay in this collection has something to teach you and I really loved the plurality of voices in here and I did get to see Canada from so many different angles in this collection and it was really enjoyable to read as well. So definitely check this one out if you're able to. The last category is to read something that's not a novel and I had a really hard time condensing my answer down to only four books but these books are all so weird and strange and I love all of them a lot. So one of them is a short story collection. This is called The Doll's Alphabet and it's by Camilla Gradova. I think this is the only thing she's published so far and like 
I'm kind of obsessed with it. So I hope that we see something from her again sometime soon. But these stories are truly strange. You have no sense of like where they're taking place or when the time period is. You feel like you're in this kind of strange dreamlike fairy tale world and I love that. And each of these premises is haunting and intriguing and I could not put these stories down. The next book I wanted to mention is like unlike anything that I've ever read before. I don't even know what to call it. This is called The Book of Jessica, A Theatrical Transformation by Linda Griffiths and Maria Campbell. And basically these are two women who collaborated to create this play called The Book of Jessica. And Linda Griffiths is a white writer and Maria Campbell is a Métis writer. And it was kind of about this disastrous clash of cultures while they were writing this play together. And half of the book is just these two having a a conversation with each other talking about everything that kind of went wrong in the writing process and how Maria Campbell felt like she shared too much about her culture and Linda Griffiths didn't respect writing about it so like they had so much tension in the artistic process that like it was just fascinating to read about because you don't really get to hear creators sharing all of these painful details in this kind of way. And then the second half of this book is the play itself. So I honestly found the first half of this was just so worthwhile. It was very dramatic, very thought provoking, and it's been a few years since I've read this, but I cannot stop thinking about it. And then to wrap things up, I have some graphic works to talk about. So one of them is Louis Riel, a comic strip biography by Chester Brown. If you think that Canadian history is boring, I challenge you to read this. This is fascinating. Louis Riel is kind of a controversial figure from Canadian history. He organized and led this rebellion and he was executed by the Canadian government. And this book gets into all of the complexity and ambiguity about his situation and himself as a character. You know, is he this visionary? Is he kind of mentally ill? You know, there's a lot going on here. And it also gets into like this conspiracy theory about whether the government kind of needed to kill him for other purposes. The simple comic style illustrations are fun in this book and make the history fun to read about, but this book was also worth reading for the extensive footnotes at the back where the author really gets into how he's depicting history. So this was a fascinating and fun read. And then lastly, I wanted to share Hark a Vagrant by Kate Beaten. Now these comics are just usually very short and they kind of take on like specific characters from literary history or from Canadian history and just makes a weird joke about them. And I think what your sense of humor is like will really depend whether you like this or not. But if you are an oddball like me, I think that these comics are going to crack you up. I thought Kate Beaton was so funny and I laughed out loud many times while reading these dumb but hilarious comics. So that's it for my recommendations for the readathon. I hope you have found some new Canadian book titles to get excited about, and I hope that you'll consider joining in for this readathon. I know that I'm very excited about participating. I've already made a TBR that is like way too large, but what else is new? Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you again next time. Bye.